more and more people believe they need some type of government program. Once they're in the system, many of them find it difficult or impossible to leave it. It's not right when the safety net turns into a trap, one that people cannot escape from. Trapping people in dependency isn't the goal of government assistance. And it isn't compassionate, not to the poor who deserve a better life, and not to middle-class workers who foot the bill. Instead, Congress should encourage the right type of tax reform and economic policy. This will encourage job creation in the country, so people have access to better opportunities and less chance of becoming dependent. College is expensive, and of course we want to help students with their college tuition, but it seems like the more federal aid colleges and universities get, the more the prices go up. Too often, taxpayer funds intended to help students obtain higher education instead end up supporting an ever-growing bureaucracy of college administrators who, in turn, raise tuition in order to fund their own salaries and pet projects. We need to lift the curtain on the causes of tuition inflation and encourage colleges and universities to do a better job of controlling costs and directing resources to the education of their students. We need to have an honest conversation about the role of federal aid and tax incentives in driving up tuition prices. Instead of asking taxpayers to pay higher taxes to fund increased federal aid, students should be asking their college administrations, why are my tuition rates going up so much? The Skills Act cuts through the red tape so that workers can enter training programs and ultimately the workforce as quickly as possible. The Skills Act also eases the application process for community and technical colleges to be included in the list of eligible training providers. The role of local employers in the training process will be strengthened under this act. If workers are being trained in skills that nearby businesses actually need, they won't have to uproot their families to find a job. Much of the administration of the program will be handled at the state level, since the people and resources closest to a problem are the ones best equipped to deal with it. Government should work for us, not work us over. But this doesn't seem to be the case with federal bureaucracies. We need to protect Americans who are forced to deal with the IRS or other federal agencies. One proposed law would require federal employees to inform citizens of their rights before subjecting them to an audit or similar actions. They would have to let you know that you have the right to record meetings and phone conversations with federal agents and auditors. Agencies might be less likely to bully us or unfairly change the ground rules of the audit if they know every word is being recorded. Did you know you already have the right to be represented by an attorney when dealing with federal agencies? If you weren't aware of that, perhaps it would show concern for ordinary Americans if the government informed them of these and other rights at the beginning of an audit. It's not fair for the government to pick winners and losers in the marketplace, especially when our nation's leaders are picking their friends to be the winners. Government bureaucrats entrusted with public safety and money should be held to an especially high standard. Karen DeLoach is a bookkeeper from Montgomery, Alabama, who wants to use her overtime to take care of aging parents and sick family members. She recently testified before the House Committee on Education and the Workforce about the real-life consequences of the current inflexible law and in favor of the Working Families Flexibility Act. 
She said of the proposed legislation, quote, I keep hearing the opposition to this is that employers are going to take advantage of employees. If I've said I want my overtime to be paid back to me in time rather than in money, then I'm making that choice. It's only right that our laws governing the workplace catch up to the realities of today's workers. Unsustainable expansion of an already broken system threatens Medicaid's ability to do what it was set up to do, serve the poor and the vulnerable. As President Obama says, poor children, grandparents, kids with autism and Down syndrome and other disabilities, quote, these are the people who count on Medicaid. We need to reform Medicaid so they can continue to count on it. Because if we overwhelm the system, we're not able to provide help for anyone. We need to construct a Medicaid health system that delivers essential health services and better outcomes while responsibly managing costs. The truth is, energy prices don't have to be as high as they are. We can drive them down with an energy policy that develops domestic resources in an environmentally sensitive manner while pursuing renewable energy sources for a sustainable energy future. A bold energy strategy includes domestic exploration, conservation, and development of a variety of renewable sources like wind, solar, geothermal, and biofuels. This way, everyone wins. If government leaders truly care about the Americans they are paid to represent, they'll work to keep the cost of energy as low as possible while also keeping our air and water clean. Instead of depending on foreign energy, we can get oil and natural gas right here at home. The U.S. and Canada are sitting on the largest oil and natural gas reserves in the world, over a trillion barrels of proven energy reserves. The Keystone Pipeline, awaiting President Obama's approval, will safely transport oil from the shale oil fields of Canada to the refineries of the southern United States. This will help keep energy resources within our hemisphere, provide a major source of affordable energy, and reduce our dependence on Middle Eastern oil. In addition, it will create tens of thousands of American jobs. To start off, we need a healthcare system where health insurers compete for our business, forcing them to keep their prices down. And then we need to make prices transparent so people know how much they're paying for the services they're using. We need to allow small businesses to pool together to offer health care at lower prices. We need to allow Americans to buy policies across state lines to foster more competition so we can bring prices down and encourage greater quality of care. We need to promote wellness and prevention by giving employers greater flexibility to reward their employees for healthy lifestyles. Right now, the tax code penalizes Americans who have to buy their own health insurance. What would be fairer would be to provide insurance tax credits for all Americans, not just employers, so they have the resources to buy the plans of their choice. We need to empower patients to choose, through competing health plans, the kind of insurance that's best for them. Competition will do a better job of controlling costs and providing quality of care than heavy-handed Washington regulations. We all want a healthy America. And when Americans get sick, we all want them to receive the best care possible. And we all want that care to be affordable. We need to focus on health care reforms that will increase affordability, treat everyone fairly, and provide the flexibility for Americans to make the best health care decisions for themselves and their families. A doctor facing a break-even or a deficit situation 
might decide to limit how many Medicare patients she takes or the amount of time spent with each patient. Reduced access to physicians and lower quality care is not an acceptable solution. It's not fair for the government to be limiting patient access to doctors. And it's really not fair that people who have paid into Medicare all through their working years face an uncertain health insurance future. Medicare is a benefit that our seniors have earned. So here's a better idea for protecting Medicare. Let's keep it from going broke, because if it's broke, it can't help anyone. To keep costs in check, we need to give future Medicare recipients the flexibility to shop for the best coverage among a set of quality plans, plans that would compete for their business and that offer guaranteed minimum benefits. Something similar has been tried in one part of Medicare, and it's actually succeeded. The truth is, we can't just tax our way out of the budget mess we're in. Sending more money to Washington, whether it comes from your pocket or from Donald Trump's, will not create jobs and grow the economy. It will just make the government bigger. And what we need to do is control spending. And we need to grow our economy. Most parents have figured out how to squeeze a penny till it screams for mercy, but wouldn't it be nice to ease that burden a little? That's why some lawmakers have proposed allowing families to keep more of their paychecks by replacing the variety of child credits with a single $4,000 credit per child. That way, middle-class parents could keep more of their own money to pay for the costs of raising their children up to age 18. That means more money available for clothing, childcare, tuition, and food. In case you're wondering, this tax credit is not another government handout. The child tax credit is for working parents to be able to keep more of their hard-earned dollars for their families. Parents have taken on the awesome challenge and financial burden of raising the next generation. There are so many regulations that it's getting to the point that it's too hard to start a small business or for current businesses to hire new employees. If you want to start a landscaping business, all you should need is a lawnmower, not an accountant and a lawyer to help you hack through all the red tape before setting up shop. With all the red tape, with the tax increases coming, with the Obamacare mandates, it's simpler for employers to keep their businesses small, which translates into fewer jobs. With all the demands on our federal budget and record levels of debt and deficit spending, I think those taxpayer dollars could be better spent elsewhere. While the party faithful party on, children and families across America struggle with life-limiting and debilitating diseases, such as autism, Down syndrome, and leukemia. Research has vastly improved management and treatment of these and other conditions, but we can always do better, and ultimately, we'd like to find cures. But that costs money. The Kids First Research Act, which has support from both parties in Congress, would eliminate the presidential campaign funding checkbox on tax returns. In its place would be a new voluntary checkbox authorizing spending for pediatric research at the National Institutes of Health. The legislation would increase federal funding for research to identify causes of and develop treatments for diseases that affect children. Our children's health should be a national priority and the time is ripe to make this change. Many of these very talented individuals, when they are required to leave by the U.S. government, either end up becoming America's direct competitors 
or go to work for our overseas competitors. For America, this does not make sense. Indeed, the American economy would be better off if these immigrants were available to stay here and work for our companies, instead of heading home to India, Brazil, China, and elsewhere to compete against us.